Welcome to the Health of Woman podcast. Today's Thursday, December 24th, 2020. In today's podcast, egg freezing, further proof that men are useless. I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Gerber, famous man hater, to discuss egg freezing. No, Rachel's not a man hater, but she's really funny. I've known her since she was a first year medical student when we did research together, and we've remained close ever since. She is now a reproductive endocrinologist or a fertility specialist at RMA of New York, and she is awesome. Rachel and I talk about the option of egg freezing, who might want to do it, what are the success rates, and what actually happens step by step. I'm sure you'll find this interesting and helpful. Next week, we take a turn from traditional medicine as I talk to Dr. Christy Matusiak about alternative, integrative, and holistic care. If you aren't sick of me already, feel free to check out two other podcasts that had me on as a guest recently, the Informed Pregnancy Podcast with Dr. Elliot Berlin and the My Essential Birth Podcast with Stephanie King and Courtney Clegg. For those of you celebrating Christmas tonight and tomorrow, I wish you and your families a wonderful and Merry Christmas. Thanks a lot. Have a great day and have a great weekend. Welcome to today's episode of Healthful Woman a podcast designed to explore topics in women's health at all stages of life. I'm your host, Dr. Nathan Fox, an OBGYN and maternal fetal medicine specialist practicing in New York City. At Helpful Woman, I speak with leaders in the field to help you learn more about women's health, pregnancy, and wellness. All right, I'm here with Dr. Rachel Gerber. How you doing? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be here. This is really exciting. Rachel is a reproductive endocrinologist, aka a fertility specialist, and you're at RMA of New York, and you are one of the doctors in their Westchester office, correct? Yes. I see patients on the east side and Westchester. Fantastic. And then we go way back, obviously. Yes. I've known Rachel since she was a young medical child, essentially. <laughs> first, first year medical school. Yes. Unbelievable. I was so lucky. I knew I wanted to do OB the moment I stepped into medical school. <laughs> and so I shadowed on the labor floor. I met Dr. Rebarber, your yeah, colleague. Yeah. And he said, hey, you know, we're doing a lot of research. And why don't you come by our office and learn about opportunities? And that's where it all began, my first year of medical school. Yeah, Andre, I remember he came back and he said, hey, I found this first year med student. And I think I roped her in to do research with us. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, which is great. You know, we try to recruit. And uh, so Rachel comes and most of the people do research with us are, you know, third year med students or residents or fellows. And Rachel's a first year med student. Rachel's a force of nature when it comes to research. She just like totally crushed it. You did a great job. Thank so it's you. Awesome. Yeah. And then we continue research. So, so tell our listeners, where are you from? What's your story? Give us your background. We're going to go into you personally first, and then we're going to talk a lot about egg freezing. Sure. So I come from Teaneck, New Jersey. I've heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> and which is a suburb of New York, but a lot of people still say you're not a New Yorker. <laughs> yeah, you're a New Yorker. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> it's close enough. Yeah. And I grew up modern Orthodox, went to yeshiva there through high school. I then was lucky enough to go to Columbia University in Manhattan. You were an engineer, right? I was a chemical engineer. Yes. Wow. That's, uh, that's <laughs> hardcore. <laughs> yeah. It it was nice because, you know, first of all, I was never a reader, reading, writing type mm -hmm. of person, but I always ace all my math and science tests. Right. So it was great just to never, I had to take one single humanities course and then everything else was math and science and I was fine with that. Right. So you, you know that I went to Columbia also. I was equally mediocre at all of the disciplines, but <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we had a, an interesting relationship with engineers because we took the pre-meds, we took the same classes mm -hmm. a lot of me. We all took chemistry in this, but the engineers were so much smarter than us in all this. And so they had to put them in a different class with a different curve. And that's why there's like a separate engineering program. But yes, several of them could not read or write. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'd so. be me. I still have my my sister review and, you know, make sure my grammar is okay, my spelling's okay, because she's like the reader writer in the family. Okay. All right. So you're, you're a Columbia School of Engineering as yes. a chemical engineer. And when did you decide you were going to go to medical school? So about mid-college, I at first thought maybe I would do something in the environmental engineering mm -hmm. realm. I always what wanted mean? helping with carbon emissions, waste management, basically different ways to, let's say, um, plastic recycling, things like that. So Rachel from New Jersey and waste management. You're like <laughs> like Tony Soprano. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. We get involved with yeah. the mafia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> from t- a lot of a lot of mafia in Teaneck. Yeah. <laughs> it's a rough part of town. At some point, I'd say about midway through, I realized that engineering is essentially just computer modeling and you're alone in a room with your computer. I'm a very talkative, friendly person. I needed human interaction. Indeed. I thrive off of, you know, chatting and building connections. And so I decided, you know what, I've taken all my pre-med courses because as you said, you have to take chemistry, you have to take physics, you have to take orgo. And I just pivoted to to medicine. Cool. I have two physician parents, so it was something I knew about. Right. And so, you know, I, I made that pivot and I'm I'm really happy. That's great. So and so how did you decide to go to Mount Sinai? Because it can't be the only school that wanted you. There was different decisions that went into it. Like for example, I got into some of the New Jersey State schools and they were cheaper. Right. They were half the price. Right. And it's definitely luring because you come out of these programs with a lot of debt. But ultimately, Mount Sinai was just a warm, welcoming place. It's where my dad is is actually a lifer there, they call it. <laughs> he did his training there. He's never left. And he's a big inspiration to me. So it was exciting. I got to do like go to Honduras with him on a medical mission. I got to be on his team for the surgery rotation, scrub in with him many times. That's awesome. That was a really cool experience. So I think I just always had a good feeling about Mount Sinai because of growing up with my dad there. Right. Were you born there? No, I was born in Beth Israel. Ah, okay. Which is now Mount Sinai. Right. So because of you, Mount Sinai had to buy Beth Israel. Yes, exactly. Well, my mom was a pathology resident at Beth Israel. Ah. So I guess she was like, you know, doing her pathology and then would just walk downstairs and have the baby. (laughs) You were her her greatest specimen. (laughs) (laughs) There's four of us, but I'm the only one who went into medicine. So there you go. All right. That's interesting. All right. So you're at Mount Sinai. And of course, that's where our paths are crossed for the first time. And okay. And from there, you decided OBGYN, you said right away. I knew right away. I just really, again, when I decided to do medicine, it was all about the human, like those connections you get with your patients, getting personal with your patients, having conversations that other people might be uncomfortable with. I thrive off of really going there with patients about relationships and their sex life and, you know, what they're embarrassed about and insecurities. Like I really- That's where you thrive. That's where I thrive. (laughs) Like I feel like I- am able, I hope, you know, to make patients feel comfortable. And it that's what gives me satisfaction is, is making patients feel comfortable and going to these difficult, embarrassing places with them and making them feel like they came out of it with a good experience and with some insight. Right. So I just felt like nothing else gives you that other than OBGYN. Yeah. It's pretty intimate in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I hate men. No, I'm joking. <laughs> no, you're not joking. I'm it's- a man hater. Yeah. So it just was totally natural. No, <laughs> but it's a good thing you have sons. Ex- yeah. I have two sons, no daughters. But I actually, some people say, "Oh, you're giving up the male patients." Well, now I actually get have a couple. Yeah. But I never felt that was a loss when right. I was going into OB. I just felt a strong connect with the women patients and mm-hmm. felt like that's where I could shine with this kind of really, you know, intimate kind. of relationship that I can make. Okay. And so you did your residency at Cornell. Yes. Right. And so at the time you were co-residents with Carolyn Friedman. Yes. Who I work with and is, uh, you know, in this podcast with a regularly. And you just saw in the hallway, which was nice, a little reunion. Yeah, it's so nice seeing residency is really like a family. Uh huh. A dysfunctional one. Yeah, but a, a dysfunctional, but, a but yeah. And even sometimes you get mad, but you know, there's always love there. Right. Even if they piss you off, someone yeah. pisses you off, whatever <laughs> yeah. it is. And it's almost like a lifelong bond, like, right. like a family member. I've never been in the military, but it's like conceptually, it's it's a group of people thrown together into these very trying and difficult circumstances. It's physically taxing. It's emotionally taxing. Obviously, it's not the same as serving you know, in the military. Mm-hmm. There's not the same risk and you know sacrifice. But when you go through that and you come out of it, you just feel that bonds. Like we went through this together and we are, you know, we're forever connected. I agree. All right. That's cool. And my (laughs) husband feels the same way about the other like husbands and wives. (laughs) Right. They had their own club of like, we are the 
husbands right. and wives were the neglected the, of the great the neglected OB residents and yeah. you know they while they're at work we can hang out and lament about how we never see our <laughs> spouses wow okay and so you you did your residency at cornell of course we we stayed in touch through all that yes. time because you're you know you're one of my faves and then how did you decide to go into a career of fertility or reproductive endocrinology and infertility rei as it's called because i wanted you to do mfm we were we were pushing hard <laughs> We were really throwing everything at you. I really didn't go in knowing. I thought about a lot of different fields, but ultimately I think what ended up doing it for me is the satisfaction that I felt out of having such a discreet outcome mm -hmm. of getting someone pregnant and having it be, you know, attainable and the steps being very laid out to get there. So, you know, just going through it, when you see those positive pregnancy tests, it's just so exciting and so like, it, it just keeps you going and it just lightens up your day. I just really thrived off of that feeling of like every day you get this positive reinforcement and this like very goal oriented care. And there's, there's many other things. So the other thing is, again, it's a very intense process. The patients are under an immense amount of stress and anxiety. Yeah. yeah. You have to manage that as well. So you have to not only provide good medical care, but provide care that, you know, makes them feel that they're cared for emotionally, that, you know, they're not just a number, that, you know, you're really thinking about them and you're in it with them, you're empathizing with them, you, you know, and have them come out of it, even if they're not pregnant, feeling like whole from the process. Right. That, you know, I feel like I was supported and we gave it our best shot and, you know, this is what we're going to change next time right. or whatever it is. But I just knew that it was much more than the medicine, which is, again, always what I've really thrived off of. So... Just a combination of being so satisfied with kind of the actual medical work and getting that patient satisfaction of holding people's hands through this really tough process. It just felt right for me. When people end up at your, you know, in your office, like you said, they're already totally stressed out because that is, it, it, they don't just show up on the, you know, the first time they're trying to get pregnant. They've exactly. already usually either they know there's going to be an issue because let's say maybe they're they're older or whatever they have you know medical mm -hmm. problems or they have nothing wrong but it just hasn't worked out yet and mm -hmm. that's a very stressful situation for people it's i guess it's sort of similar to when people come to to my office for high risk ours is a little maybe more fear than stress mm -hmm. in that sense they're worried about what's going to happen and for you it's a strip but it's it is is there's so much of the psychology aspect and the social work aspect and the counseling. There's just so much that goes into that. What's interesting is, you know, in New York City where you did your residency and at Cornell, there's a, you know, world-class infertility mm -hmm. center there. I mean, really one of the top in, you know, on earth. But in Manhattan, there's a there's a bunch of them. And we're talking, there's a lot of places that are there just are. unbelievable, which is interesting, right? And so people come from all over to various places in Manhattan. But I think one of the advantages is when you're doing a residency in New York, you get exposure to such good infertility care and what it's like. Because in other programs where maybe it's not as prevalent or it's not as potentially as you know research-based as world class, in residency, you wouldn't normally have a lot of that because you're not doing fertility treatments as a resident. I mean, you'll diagnose people who have fertility issues, but they'll go somewhere else. And so a lot of residents don't get exposure to that yes. in order to decide they want to go into it. Yeah, it's a somewhat like niche field. It's not your bread and butter OBGYN. Right. You know, you can't avoid MFM. You can, right. Yeah, you cannot avoid MFM during your residency, but you 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 really need to seek out getting mm -hmm. good REI exposure. So at Cornell, you know, it's really great for that. And that's why they match so many of their residents into it because we get such great exposure. Also, people who know they want to go into it 
tend to go there as well because right. it has such a great reputation and does such a good job at preparing us for fellowship. Right. And so ultimately, you did your fellowship in Einstein. Yes. And what was that like? It was awesome. I honestly would not have rather be anywhere else because Montefiore Einstein is a really special place because it's just in the middle of a very underserved community that's very densely populated. Right. It's very high volume, high acuity patients who are just very in need of of people who care for them, despite the fact that they, you know, don't have insurance, they don't have, you know, the money you find in New York. And because of that, you know, you feel almost like you have to hold their hand more, make sure that they get to their consult consulting appointments and make sure that you stay on top of the patient or they'll get up, get lost. Like, okay, so go do your HSG, go get a semen analysis, go see, you know, hires pregnancy, go to GI, get clear. Right. You know, it's like for some patients in Manhattan, you know, organizing that they could do it there. It's a much more like the health literacy and just navigating the system is much harder for these patients. And so I felt a very strong ownership over over that and making sure my patients got through their workup so we could actually move ahead with fertility treatments. Right. And in, in one of our earlier podcasts we had on Javi Karkowski. Yes. Right. Who's, mm-hmm. you know, who, who you know, who I know. But she was describing the same thing because obviously she's at the same mm-hmm. institution and that idea of, you know, for a lot of what she has to do for patients is literally just, you know, rolling up your sleeves and doing it. And yes. that, that's that's how you show you care that you just get involved and you don't say, oh, do A, B, C and D. You really have to sometimes do that for them or help mm-hmm. people based on who they are and what their circumstances are. And there's there's real value in learning and practicing and doing that because not everyone not everyone can do that for someone else. Yes. And then I remember they're saying, you know, once you go and, you know, you're an attending with a lot of patients, you can't do that anymore. Because right. I got really used to doing like making all of the consults for my patients, right. calling up radiology and making appointments for my patients. Right. My tens would be like, you know, you're not going to be able to do this once you have. Right. But, you know, it was something that I just felt like I need my patient to do this. I, You know, I, I got to make it happen. Or it, I just felt this like, you know, feeling like if I didn't do it, no one else was. Right. And I got very close with my patients and attached to my patients like through this process. Right. And so now you're at RMA of New York and you're, you know, the big star there. (laughs) And so tell me, how's that been? How's it been transitioning from, you know, fellowship where you're, you know, doing all stuff to now you're, you know, you're the big doctor. It's really nice. I have to say RMA, you know, is a big practice with, amazing people from the more senior people to the new people. Everyone's been really welcoming, holding my hand through the process, making sure I'm comfortable with everything. I really don't have a bad thing to say. And it's really nice, you know, if you need something done, the nurses or your IVF coordinator, they collect the records and they, yeah. you know, make sure. And, you know, I'm just like, oh, wow. OK, yeah. so You're I like, guess I, I, I can just be a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new world. And I appreciate those people so much because yeah. I'm like, you know, I'm not used to. But, you know, at this point, my time and, you know, efforts are best served just seeing patients and right. taking them through for, you know, their fertility treatment. So right. it's been a great experience. And you're currently both in, as you said, in the men. Manhattan office on the east side as well as in Westchester, but you're also, the the plan is to expand in the Westchester area, correct? Yes. So in the months to come, <laughs> we will be um, opening an office in northern Westchester and an embryology lab. Right. That's big for people. Huge. Who realize the embryology lab is sort of like the center point of the infertility exactly. treatments because you need, like, what do you do with these embryos? That, that That's where the science is, how to protect them and care for them and watch for them and test them and do all these things. And exactly. You need, you need a world-class lab with air filtration and, you know, all these things on the yes. right, everything. It, takes it has a to lot be, of yeah. money to build a right. new lab. Yeah, you can't and just do it in your basement. Yes. And yeah. they're in, investing in yeah. this <laughs> and we're expecting that it's going to be a great venture. You know, there's been a somewhat of a boom in the housing market up in Northern Westchester. Yeah, yeah Jersey too. Same. And New Jersey. And so we're thinking that this is definitely, you know, patients are going to want to to stay there for their care. And if they can get, you know, the same level and of care they could get in Manhattan, you know, and they're getting that same practice up in Westchester. It's yeah. a huge benefit That's for, awesome. for everybody. That's awesome. So 
let's talk about egg freezing. So first of all, this is a topic you suggested to me when mm-hmm. we were talking. You're like, wow, you know, you should do a podcast on egg freezing. And I totally agree. So many people ask me about it. Mm-hmm. I assume it's a, it's a major part of what you're doing in consultations and discussing with patients. So why is it important? Like what what about egg freezing makes it so topical? Well, really nice thing is that it's being really popularized in the media and people are learning about it. And because of that, you know, we're getting a lot more aware about really what our biological clock means. So essentially, the whole concept of egg freezing is women are born with all the eggs that we will ever have. And even from birth, we're on a slow slope down of losing eggs. And it's not as bad as it sounds. We still have plenty of eggs to get us through our, our you know, reproductive life. But unlike men who are, you know, producing millions and millions of sperm from puberty until they die. Right. Is that why you hate men? Yes, yeah. I'm <laughs> jealous of their sperm production. Yeah. <laughs> there really is there really is a biological clock where, you know, egg counts are declining with time right. and with and age. And also it, the the counts decline but also the the eggs that remain usually the the quality is lower exactly. as you get older. So there's two things that happen as women age. One is that the counts decline and the other is that occurrence of genetic abnormalities called chromosomal abnormalities mm-hmm. where there's an extra chromosome or missing chromosome that also significantly increases with age. So not only are you working with fewer but the ones you have are more likely to be genetically abnormal and not able to produce a healthy child. Right. Which is why as women get older, even if they don't have, you know, quote unquote, fertility issues and they get pregnant, the rate of miscarriage goes up as you get older. Mm-hmm. And it's really for that reason, like you could have a totally working, you know, system, you know, the egg sperm, everything works fine. But if that egg by chance is abnormal, you're going to miscarry and those chances go up as you get older, unfortunately. Along with Down syndrome, which is something that people classically know about, that the the chances of Down syndrome go up and it's all part of the same concept. Right. Now that we really have a good idea about this and women are kind of becoming more and more aware of the reality of this, you know, we've come up with this tool to kind of freeze somebody's literally literally <laughs> their fertility at a moment in time and be able to kind of keep that age and egg quality frozen and even as they age that that will never change for those eggs right is this something that people come and ask you about or is it something that you bring up with patients or how how does it sort of work logistically with these types of conversations are people calling your office all the time to ask about it yes people are typically calling for egg freezing consult they typically might hear about it from friends or we actually do and a lot of other you know big practices do egg freezing programming where we will set up question answer nights now through zoom it used to be more maybe like a cocktail setting or something like that now we have these zoom sessions called like egg freezing 101 and we advertise through you know social media and things like that people sign up just to hear about what does it entail should i get this you know what are my chances of having a baby with this technology when's the right time to get it so we we have you know our own avenues to talk to patients about that. But we get probably about 50% of my consults are people that are coming to me who have already made the decision to freeze their eggs. And then by the time they get to me, often it's a referral from their GYN or their OBGYN that they say, hey, you know, I'm thinking of freezing my eggs and OBGYN refers them to the fertility doctor to really delve into that. Right. So who should consider doing it or who does consider doing it? And the the first one that you said is just women who are, they're getting older, let's say, and Mm -hmm. they you know, haven't yet started to try to have kids, right? Either they're yes. for whatever reason, right? And yes. and they're so is that the majority, would you say? That is the majority. There's a class of patients who really we recommend it 
even at younger ages, let's say like in their 20s, that's for patients, first of all, like uh, cancer patients who are undergoing chemotherapy. Right. Because Uh, because the chemotherapy could could damage the ovaries and the eggs and and cause infertility. So if you you take the eggs out first. Exactly. Yeah. And it can deplete their egg stores more rapidly than your normal aging process does. Even teenagers have had this. Sometimes, you know, people childhood cancers and, and, Mm -hmm. you know, you want to make sure that they have fertility because again, fortunately, if they're going to survive and do well, and then they're 20, 30, 40, you don't want them to also be infertile now. It'd be great if you could have their eggs. Exactly. Frozen. So yeah, we I've seen it plenty of, of in their teens even yeah, for that right. purpose. Another thing is like, let's say somebody has recurrent ovarian cysts or, or severe endometriosis and is getting ovarian tissue removed, like getting surgeries where we re- they're removing parts of their ovaries, or they needed to have an ovary removed at some right. point. These are people who are at risk for premature depletion of right. their egg counts, and they might consider doing it really even in their mid-20s. Right. Your average person that we see are really people in their early 30s to late 30s who are single they're dating they're out there trying all the apps and (laughs) the swipes and (laughs) in the grind and or they're really career oriented they're on you know a great track to be you know a doctor lawyer business whatever they're going to do they just have not found the person that they want to settle down with, but they know that they want that in the future, or, you know, that's still something that an option they want to maintain. And so they come to us and say, you know, I'm interested in freezing my eggs because, you know, I want to have a family one day, or I want the option of having a family one day, but right now it's not happening. And I I don't see the time that it will. Right. And I imagine there's also also a stressful situation, a different kind of stress. That's really the stress of what if, I don't know when, that whole idea of what's the future going to bring. And I know, listen, a, a lot of people, it's very stressful for them if they, you know, they haven't found the right person. Or as you said, they're they're very busy. They're working hard. They're doing, you know, great things. And they're like, listen, I don't want to get to age 40 and then at that point start, you know, potentially having problems or issues. It, even though you don't know it's going to happen, there's just a, a chance. Right. I I completely agree. So another thing is, is that some companies, particularly Silicon Valley companies, the most common ones, Facebook and Google, actually offer egg freezing benefits for their patients. And I've seen a few patients that are coming from there and they're coming at a younger age than your average patient. Right, to keep them off maternity leave? <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah, we'll delay that by 10 years. <laughs> they say it's to retain the talent. It's a mm-hmm. benefit that they give to retain great female talent. It's awesome. So they'll often come and say, hey, I'm I'm 30, but I have this benefit and I want to use it because, right. you know, who knows? who knows, but if I'm going to get this covered by, you know, my company, then I'm going to use this, this amazing benefit and I'm going to, it's going to take a stress off of me going forward. Right. Have you had any patients yet who are doing this as a part of their transition process for transgender? Yes. Right. So I have seen that prior to starting androgen therapy to retrieve eggs so that, you know, they could kind of move forward uninterrupted. So I have seen that and it can be complicated because, for example, you know, we do transvaginal ultrasounds um, right. during this process, and that can be a very difficult thing for these patients. Right. I know for patients I've seen in the past, we'll do abdominal ultrasounds through the the stimulation, which is right. not ideal, but it can be done. Doable. Right. And then just we tell them when you have your retrieval, we have to do the transvaginal, right. you know, but you'll be asleep. Right. Love anesthesia. It's a very rewarding thing to do, but can be difficult for them right. to kind of process going through egg retrieval while they're also right. <laughs> trying to figure out their gender identity and yeah. they're, you know, moving forward with that. And studies have really come out to look at you know, whether you need to come off hormone therapies or mm-hmm. not. And I think some data is coming out saying potentially you you don't really need to. Used to be how long do you need to come off of it? Right. So they wanted to have people, let's say you, if they if you can catch them before it starts, which I've seen, you know, that's great, but you know, often it's, you know, after they've already gone through the transition. So, you know, people say does it doesn't need to be one month, does it need to be two months? And now some data is coming out to say maybe they don't have to go off of wow, it at all. That's so, so interesting. Just so everyone understands the biology of it, egg freezing is different from embryo freezing, yes. meaning if you have a couple, right, and they're mm-hmm. together, 
And for whatever reason, they're not going to have kids for a while mm -hmm. and they're going to freeze embryos. So that's different, right? Because that's that's a fertilized egg, egg plus sperm embryo, and that's being frozen as opposed to just the egg. Yes. So it's fun you say that because my mom always confuses the word egg and embryo, like when I'm talking to her. Right. And I'm always like, no, embryo, The mom. pathologist. <laughs> yeah. The physician pathologist. Exactly. Right. Like, okay. No, embryo. <laughs> you know, no, it's an egg because- you know, it's sometimes really hard yeah. to get straight the egg right. and the they embryo. They both start with the letter E. Yes, exactly. Right. But embryo freezing is in some ways has benefits over egg freezing. So when you freeze an egg, you're really far from a pregnancy, right? So when you freeze an egg, you know, you have to then fertilize that egg. You then have to grow it to an, to be an embryo, usually day, day to day five through seven. Then you have to get an idea, is that likely to be a genetically normal embryo or not, right? So you can either test it to find out or, you know, just based on age, get an idea. And then once you have, let's say, a genetically normal embryo, there's still only a 60% chance that each embryo implants. So when you have an egg, there's still a lot of unknowns to get through and steps to get through before you get to hold right. that baby. Right. When you freeze embryos, you're kind of all the way right. down that line right. where you can say, I have a genetically normal embryo. Right. I know exactly what the fertility potential of this embryo is. It's you know going to be 60%. And then if I have two normal embryos, you know it's going to go up to like an 80% chance of right. having a baby. Embryo freezing really is scientifically a better process. They also thaw better than eggs, right? right. When, when you defrost them, right. they have a higher survival rate. I often sometimes say to the patients, so, you know, what is the benefit of eggs over embryos? And they look at me, well, with an embryo, you're tied to that sperm, right? Like, right. <laughs> like you're you're going all in on that right. sperm once right. you make an embryo. That's, right. that's the downside. Right. So if you have a partner that you are sure that you want that partner to be the father of your baby, or even if you're like, I want to do this alone right. and be a single mom, not deal with all the drama that men bring, right. then you get your donor sperm and make embryos. And that really is a more ideal process. But most people are not there. Most right. patients want to still have the option open to use the sperm that they want when that sperm comes along. Right, right. This is this is how Rachel sees men. Just <laughs> just, just just large creatures that 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 walk about the earth containing sperm. Right. Exactly. <laughs> or just vessels. That's to what I yeah. tell my husband. <laughs> I say, I have no need for you um, yeah. <laughs> anymore. So <laughs> it's uh, no, but, but that's how you view them. OK, that's fine. So, <laughs> so I mean, again, it, it, it makes a lot of sense. You talk about it because if someone, even if a couple comes and they're going to go through IVF, it starts with, you know, retrieving eggs mm -hmm. from her. And let's say you'll get 10, 20, 30 eggs, whatever it is. But then when you fertilize them, suddenly it's not. 30 embryos. Now it's 12 embryos. And then right. when you test them, you know, only six of them are normal. Exactly. And, and so you're sort of working your way down. And but again, it's, it's almost like a, a natural selection process. Those six embryos, each one of them is going to have a better success than the original 30 eggs. eggs. And exactly. so and so when you're freezing eggs, you just sort of halt the process mm -hmm. right there. Now, just because you mentioned it, the, the thawing, what is the likelihood if you freeze an egg and it thaws that it's going to go through the process successfully. Like right. Harrison Ford did, for example, in uh, Return of the Jedi when he was defrosted <laughs> and he came out no problem. Han Solo made it through the process. <laughs> so, you know, the generally the thaw rates for eggs are between 80 and 90 percent. And they've really gotten better. It used to be lower. It used but, to be like 20 to 30 yes, percent. Our yeah. technologies, we have something called vitrification. It's mm -hmm. a new technology, flash freezing mm -hmm. in a liquid nitrogen. And that whole process has really furthered the field of fertility preservation and egg and embryo freezing. And I think that's part of what has now made it uh, go from a designation of an experimental treatment to an FDA approved treatment for yeah. fertility preservation. That's a huge difference because, again, in, you're talking just five to 10 years ago, the success of thawing an egg was 20 to 25 percent. So people, it may not be worth it also because right. the likelihood is, you know, if only 20 to 25 percent of the eggs are going to, you know, make it. 
through the process and you're spending all this money and time and effort, whatever. But if it's 80 to 90, that's really good. Yeah. So it's a little different. So it's a little higher the younger you are, like right. like a, a lot of this process. The young the younger you are, the better they thaw. But in general, yeah, about 80, 90 percent thaw. For embryos, it's closer to 98 to 99%. Right. So it's a really rare occurrence that an embryo doesn't thaw. And then once you go to your next step of fertilization, you know, typically we have about 70% fertilization rate, let's say. Of course, again, it has to do with if the sperm is, right. you know, what the sperm is like. Again, what is the age and of, of the patient at the time of freezing? And then after that, you have about a 50 to 60% chance of going to to blast, which right. the blast is our term for a uh, embryo that we right. can now put back. Right. It's not an explosion, but uh, it's, it's short for, <laughs> for, for those who don't know, it's short for blastocyst, which is yeah, a medical sure. term. Exactly. Yeah, it, it does sound like you like use a, a firearm and shoot it into her. You know? Well, w- one interesting thing is like, you know, I never really realized this until I became an REI, but humans have like a shell, just like an egg has a shell. Right. And we actually hatch out of our shell. Right. And that happens at, at the blastocyst stage. So it's kind of cool because you actually watch it kind of like really just shoot out of its shell. And just like an egg, we're really just like a chicken. We're really not that different than, we're than not reptiles. So, we're, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> we're not we're really not. So take me through the process. So let's say someone comes to you and she is pretty certain she wants to do this and she meets with you and obviously you make sure that there's no reason she shouldn't do it. Or, you know, you talked about, you know, all this, you know, the decision, but she decides and you decide we're going to do it. Mm-hmm. So step by step, what what would happen? How does that work in terms of how long does it take? What procedures does she need? What medications? You know, all of those. The process start to finish is typically two weeks. And that's after, let's say, maybe from initial consultation, it could be anywhere up to a month before we can get you into a cycle. Mm -hmm. Um, And that often actually depends where in your cycle you are, because we typically start with your period. right? Right. So if you happen to come when your period's the next week. We could really potentially start it the next week. But if you're three weeks from your period, you know, then we have to wait a little longer. And they could wait months if they want to. They could wait months. That's up to you. So some patients are like, I want to go ASAP. Some patients just want to hear about it, mull over it, you know, think about the finances, you know, all that, get their, get the finances together and get emotionally, you know, prepared for it and say, you know, give me a couple months. So Mm -hmm. You get the the right. whole like you know slew of different people um, who have different timelines. But once you actually start, what it is is really injections. So two to three injections a day. Those are injections that go really into your lower abdominal fat. So they're small needles. There we call them subcutaneous. It just goes right under the skin. And people definitely, I think, have more of an emotional fear about it, of the concept of injecting themselves and going through this very kind of emotionally taxing process of freezing your eggs and understanding what that means. And but the injection itself, most of what I hear is that the buildup is is worse yeah. than the injection. Right. And what are they injecting themselves with? So they're injecting themselves with hormones mm-hmm. that basically grow the eggs that they have in their ovaries. So let me take one step back. So every month at the start of the month, a certain number of eggs get brought up from the ranks mm-hmm. in the ovaries, from the microscopic eggs. They get brought up to battle it out to ovulate that month, right? Those are called antral follicles. In a normal natural cycle, one of those follicles grows and takes off and basically kills all the rest. Right. It's like a little battle yeah. or war going on. <laughs> and then you get the winner. The it's like str- a little hunger games in exactly. the ovary. Exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's a ovary <laughs> hunger games where the one builds up, you know, the most strength and the most hormone receptors and soaks up all the the egg food and the mm. rest get left yeah. behind and they they just we call it a treasure they kind of just yeah. they they die so what we do is we tell the body you know don't just pick one right you know if you have 10 to start we're we're going to pick you all you all are winners right um, <laughs> everyone's and- <laughs> a winner <laughs> <laughs> and we flood you with you know we 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 flood the system with with hormones so that, you know, not just the strongest one with the most hormone receptors can respond, but we can actually get all of those eggs to respond. And so really the the initially the two different injections you take are really, as one of my attendings used to call it, they're egg food. They're just hormones that grow these eggs. And while this process is going on, you actually come into the office every 
two to three days to start to get blood work and ultrasound so we can make sure that your hormone levels are going up appropriately. We're not hyper-stimulating you and right. making you, you know, become a an egg farm, bloated, right. you know, egg farm, you know, also to know, do we need to increase the medications, decrease the medications? And we physically watch the the eggs. They're called follicles when we look at them. We physically watch the, the follicles grow and we measure them. Right, because the egg is microscopic. The egg but is microscopic. The, the, the fluid they're in, you see exactly. on ultrasound. Right. So, you know, they, they look like just, they almost look like a cyst would, which is just a fluid filled circle. But we know that there's eggs there. Right. And when we watch your hormone rise, we know that, you know, there's healthy eggs there. So, you know, that that is going on for about a week. And then once your eggs get big enough, we add in a third shot to right. prevent you from ovulating because right. your body at some point is like, okay, right. yeah. I got all this going on. I got all these large follicles. It's time to release them. Right. But we don't want you to release them into your, you know, Right. Pel- pelvis. Right. We want you. We want to get them. We want to get them, you know, ourselves. So right. just to interrupt you for one second there. This process that you've been discussing, number one, during this time, people can still go to work. They're not like ill, right? I mean, of course. Yeah. Yes. P- a lot of our patients, they like to come, you know, some, not everyone, but, you know, they want to get in at 645 for their ultrasound. Right. Pre-COVID, this was more of, of a thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, now the work from home makes it a little easier. And and then they're, they're out and going to work. Yes. Right. This is not something that really is going to change your day, like how you live your day-to-day life. The one thing is, you know, as the ovaries get big, the most common complaint is that they feel bloated because right. they are literally full they're of bloated. ovary right. and they're bloated. And so once your ovaries get large, we do say, you know, take it easy with the exercise right. because we don't want them bouncing up and down right. and potentially twisting. And also at that point, we say, you know, also hold off from having sex. Right. Because in case you ovulate, you'll you'll be octomom. Yeah, well, that's right. that's true. <laughs> right. So so really, let's say for the first couple days until your ovaries get big, you know, you can still exercise, have sex, do it. There's no restrictions. Once they get big, you can still go to work, right. go out to dinner with your friends. You can even have, you know, a glass of wine here and right. there. But just, you know, lay off of the intense exercise and things right. where your ovaries right. are going to be moving a lot. So yes, it's right. not something where you're like locked up for two weeks. Right. Women are going to to the, to the work and yeah. living their lives and kind of just, you know, having a friendly visit with us every right. other morning. Right. And and also the, this process that you're describing is also the exact same process that a woman who's about to undergo IVF would do or someone who is herself an egg donor. It, exactly. It's the same process. Exactly. Of, and, we'll, and we'll sort of say where that point differentiates, but it's the same thing that anyone exactly. undergoing IVF would do. Mm-hmm. Okay. So now she's she got the shot to not ovulate. And so- right. And so now once enough of the eggs are large enough that, you know, we think the eggs are fully cooked and ready mm-hmm. to come out, we give you a shot to actually trigger ovulation because we've been stopping it all that time. Mm-hmm. Now we want you to ovulate. And 36 hours later, we put you to sleep mm-hmm. and we actually suction the eggs out through a, a vaginal procedure. Right. And so just so people understand that this is done not in the hospital, but in your office. Exactly. Right? So there's an anesthesiologist there, mm-hmm. gives you an IV, you go to sleep, so you're comfortable. The procedure itself is done with a, a needle through there's an ultrasound in the vagina exactly. and a needle that goes through there mm-hmm. to the ovaries as well, meaning there it is a needle that's puncturing your body going into the ovary, mm-hmm. but it, it's not through your belly and you're asleep. Yes. So it's not painful. And when you wake up, there's no like stitches or anything. Exactly. No, it's, it's yeah. There's no incisions. Yeah. You know, it's really just like a neat, it's a, it's a yeah. puncture. Um, yeah. It's like a needle puncture. And let's say those punctures are in a hidden spot. Right. No one will see right. them. <laughs> right. On your end, how long does that procedure actually take? Once she goes to sleep, from when Honestly, you start to when you finish. 10, 10 15 minutes right. at most. And then she wakes up and when she's not groggy, she goes home. Exactly. And I, I usually tell them that day, you know, maybe don't go to work. Like some patients, you know, they're like, can I go to work in the afternoon? I say, you know, you're going to be groggy because you, right. get, you get propofol, you get, you know, yeah. real deal anesthesia. And right. I don't know that you'd be on your A game. Right. Right. Now with the yeah. work from home, though, I'm maybe. Like, maybe you could sign on and, right. you know, sit right. on your computer. But if it meant going to the office and yeah. being on your A game, I, I would say 
for that day at least hold right. off and by the next day they, yeah. they're they're back to work yeah it's the same anesthesia people get for olnoscopy for exactly. example it's it's you know maybe their wisdom teeth out it's a similar exactly. type of uh, type of anesthesia and so at this point so they've had the procedure you've harvested or retrieved a certain number of eggs hopefully a lot and then this is where it differs so like if if they're going to freeze their eggs then where do they go? They go to the lab that does the that does the freezing. So our lab is one lab. So you know, right, right. I mean, the next room. The next yeah. room. So the lab's attached to the op. You know, the procedure room. So as you're, you know, doing the procedure, you're getting a real time count, which is right. very satisfying. You know, they go one, two, yeah. three. Go yay! I got that. You know, yeah. we're getting eggs. Right. And so by the end of the procedure, you know how many you've got. And right. so when the patient wakes up, they they know if they're doing egg freezing that same day, they get frozen in the liquid nitrogen, like I said, flash frozen, and then they're in storage. Right. And now since it's an egg and it's only one cell, you can't test the egg for genetic abnormalities. Exactly. Right. Because you would you would destroy the egg and do like you could do it, but you would destroy the egg. So yes. when, when people get their eggs frozen, let's say there's what's a what's a typical number for someone who's a uh, let's say a 35 year old woman, how many you're gonna get yeah, on average? On average. Ballpark. Let's say 10 to 15 eggs. Fine. So you have 10 to 15 eggs. You don't know which ones are genetically normal or abnormal. Exactly. Since you're younger, presumably there's a higher chance mm-hmm. that they're normal. So they all get frozen and then she's done, correct? Right. So then you really have a a consult where you say, you know, are we happy with this outcome? You know, so there's tools that we can use to try and give someone an idea based on, you know, the usual statistics of how eggs do. You might say, okay, you have 10 eggs, you're 35. What are your chances of, of having a live birth from this, Right. you know, from this amount of eggs? And let's say it could be, you know, 70% 70% chance of having a live birth. Okay, well, what if we got 10 more eggs? Now right. you're up to, you know, a 90% right. chance. Right, I means she could do it again, so, let's say. So yes, you can do it again. And often it's it's very much a financial decision, yeah. but really sometimes, you know, patients come and say, you know, I'm doing this once, what I get is what I get. That's all I can afford. Other patients say, you know, I want to get to that 99% chance that I'm going to have a live birth from right. this. Right, so they'll do it several and, times. And they'll do it several times. And a lot of that has to do with what your baseline egg counts are. So, right, right. You know, one of the main things that tells us, you know, how well you're going to do is is a test called the AMH, the, the mm-hmm. anti-malarian hormone. Based on that, we kind of can get an idea of what to expect from a cycle. Again, once you have your outcome, you make a decision, you know, are we happy? Are we not? You know, right. that kind of thing. If Just so uh, everyone understands, if she weren't doing egg freezing and she were doing IVF, instead of freezing the eggs that day, you would fertilize the eggs that day. Yes. He would give it, he would give it, you know. Uh, a sperm sample, a semen sample, and exactly. then you would, and then you would do it there, and then you would be looking in the lab how many become embryos, and then you go from there. Exactly. So, so again, the process is the exact same thing as IVF, but you just sort of stop exactly. after the day you of the stop retrieval. that day. Right. And what is the for her? What is the recovery time from after she has the procedure till her ovaries sort of come back to normal? She's not bloated, and she sort of feels so let's say, within a typical. week. You know, I think the bloating will come down significantly, mm-hmm. and really by two weeks, the ovaries will have shrunken down to their normal right. size. So the whole thing is then basically four weeks, start yes. to finish, from when mm-hmm. she starts to when she's sort of back to normal, exactly. which is one cycle. And what is the cost of this typically if someone's they don't have any coverage for it? What is a typical cost? It's a tough question to answer. There's different programs and people have different costs. I'd say, you know, on average, maybe the egg freezing itself can be in the range in four to $6,000. But then when you add medication costs. Right. A lot of it is um, the the hormones that you inject are expensive. Believe it or not, that almost doubles the cost. Yeah. Yeah. So that you end up closer to eight to 10,000. Right. And there are some places that are cheaper than others. Right. Patients will often do price comparisons yeah. and see these different programs. And, um, you know, a lot goes into making the decision of where you are going to freeze your eggs. So some people might say it's purely going to be financial, right? right. Cheapest place, I'm going to go there. Other people and a lot of people say, you know, I want a place that's been doing this for a long time, has babies from this for a long right. time has an IVF lab that actually grows, fertilizes and grows these, doesn't just stop at the eggs. So you know what their actual outcomes are for live births. Often those bigger programs that 
have those outcomes and have the data and the long term outcomes that right. have been doing it for 10, 15 years might be a little more expensive, to be yeah. honest. Yeah. And it, it also the times when insurance might cover it, I suppose, again, if your company has benefits, it's not really insurance that's a benefit. But I guess if there's like a medical indication, they'll sometimes yes. cover it before, like you said, for chemotherapy. And but, they will. But for the for the sort of more common situation it's it's, social egg freezing yeah, is kind of the, yeah and it's 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 typically not covered i would imagine it's typically not yes got it the, the thing is you know you know us as fertility doctors we we don't like the term social egg freezing it's basically preventative medicine right you're yeah. preventing infertility in the future and you know we see it as preventative care like anything else you do to kind of hold off having a, a med you know some sort of medical or health issue in the future of course we think that <laughs> it should be covered by insurance and you know now with this amazing new york state mandate um that that came through for large companies have to cover ivf mm -hmm. and they have to cover egg freezing for cancer patients and right. patients who are at risk of early egg depletion and hopefully one day they could see that if you're covering infertility then this is basically right. a preventative measure for infertility. Right. Well, it's also, I mean, if, if someone, if you're an insurance company or take insurance out of the equation, you're just a couple and you have your own finances. If you're going to have to pay for your IVF, this may be more cost effective potentially, right? Because you're doing it, you're, it, it's it costs, but you're doing it on the front end to mm -hmm. prevent potentially issues on, on the back end. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a way probably to have an actuary figure it out and exactly mm -hmm. what the math is, but there is math there. Like there is a benefit potentially. And so if an insurance company is saying, listen, we're going to have to cover IVF, maybe we're better off having, right. our, having our subscribers do, you know, if they want to obviously right, do this in their thirties and maybe have a better success rate, fewer IVF cycles, fewer complications. Also the pregnancies might be lower risk, you know, ultimately mm -hmm. if the eggs are younger and there's, it's hard to know this because the data isn't perfect, right. but conceptually it makes sense that if, if the whole process is going to have to be covered by somebody that it may be better off to just start early. Yeah. And, and another benefit, you know, it's really kind of weighing the pluses and minuses when you think about what age should somebody do it, right? So if you do it, let's say in your early 30s, you're more likely to need fewer cycles, right? Right. Because your eggs have less genetic abnormalities and you're right. likely to get more eggs at right. a time, but you're also less likely to use them. Right. Because you, you may find have someone in a year. More of right. a chance to find someone and, and have, you know, a baby, right. you know, in exactly right. in the next couple right. years. And when the you're technology still... might improve in two or three years. Yeah. And then you feel like, oh, you know, I did it, you know, I, you know, I got the I got the, the, the 2020 old, model yeah, and I want like the 2023 the iPhone, model. You know? yeah. I have the iPhone nine and I can't. You know, it doesn't whatever. It doesn't cook breakfast for me right. like the new iPhone does. So but once you, you get to your late 30s, you know, you usually need more than one cycle to right. reach that 80 plus percent chance of having a live birth from, right. from that baby from that you know, cycle. Yeah. And another thing to keep in mind is a lot of people want more than one baby. Right. So <laughs> often it'll be like, okay, well at, you know, 30, if I have 10 eggs, I have a really good shot of having one baby. Well, actually I want three babies. Okay. Right. Then maybe we need to do another cycle. So you kind right. of have to plan right. with that as well. I think some studies have, have done a cost benefit analysis have really shown that mid thirties is a sweet spot in terms right. of where you're actually you you still have a nice outcome right. in not terms too late, of getting not too early. A, yeah. a, a baby from it, but you have actually a higher chance of actually using that. Yeah, that makes no, that makes a lot of sense. It's all very interesting. I imagine you must have people also who do egg freezing and then let's say a year or two later, find someone and they're not going to use the eggs. They're going to try on their own. And exactly. this and, and it's like their insurance policy, A, if it doesn't work or B, let's say they want to have four kids. And so at their fourth kid, she's going to be, you know, in her forties and maybe that, that time. all the time yeah. that they come in after having a, a baby or two on right. their own. And then they come in in their forties right. for, for the second or third kid. And now they have these, these eggs right. frozen. So yeah, it's, you know, it, it's not all about that, that first baby things happen. Maybe sometimes People get divorced right. and they want to have a, uh, you know, yeah. meet someone new and want to have a family sure. at a later age and they can go back to those eggs. I've seen some patients, interestingly, you know, they have a boyfriend, let's say they're not 100% sure on and we'll discuss freezing half eggs, half embryos. So kind of hedging. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I like that. And I've seen that more so in, unfortunately, in cancer well, what, patients. How does that conversation work? 
Honey, let's, let's freeze embryos, but I'm going to hang on a couple eggs just in case I find someone better. You know, well, well you know, let's, the, not, the, let's not the fertilize husband, all of them. You the know? husband, or not, if it's a husband, this doesn't happen typically, but it, <laughs> typically they're not in the room for that right. consultation. <laughs> Wait, honey, you're, why are we only fertilizing half those eggs? What, what are we doing the other half? Uh, just in case, you know, you're, you're okay. Sometimes the but... guy, believe it or not, I've seen cases where the guy's on board. Like the guy's also like, you know, you know, I, I think this is going well, but I see your point, you know. Or another case where it has seemed more, you know, like an easier conversation is if you're doing egg freezing for, for cancer, where someone finds out they have a cancer diagnosis, they now have a week Right. To decide freeze embryos or freeze eggs. And they're in right. a relationship and now it's like, bam, right. are you going to get married to this guy? Do you want to be tied to this sperm forever? Right. And then it's like an easier decision to say, let's hedge and let's do eggs and embryos. Right. Plus he can't, you know, she's about to get treatment for cancer, so he can't talk back. Oh, I mean, yeah, exactly. He's like, yeah, hey, whatever, whatever you say, it's all good. Exactly. <laughs> I'll do anything. It's okay. And another option that I always discuss with my patients is sometimes I say to them, is it important for you to have a baby whether or not you end up with a partner. Right. If you hit a point where you think, you know, is there a point you might hit where you say, you know what, I'm doing this on my own. Right. In that case, you can freeze some embryos with donor sperm right. and some eggs. And that's right. why, you know, you have your embryos that you can test or that you have a, right. this much higher implantation rate and save those and still try and meet, you know, Mr. Right, right, in, right. On, or, you know, on, on the way. That's so. amazing. And just in terms of long term, do we know how long they can be stored and still survive? Does like does uh, time matter? Indefinitely, indefinitely. is, so, is yeah. what we would say right now. As, we, and, yeah, that's what we know with embryos, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we have 20, 30 year old embryos at this right. point. What what happens to unused eggs? Someone said, you know, I'm hanging it up. I'm done. I never needed them or I whatever. I needed some of them. What What happens to them? So, Ultimately. you know, when you start, you do sign a lot of paperwork that talks about different disposition for the eggs. Ultimately, you know, once in, in every case, there's a storage fee, right, to mm -hmm. maintain these. Like an annual. An annual fee. Right. Often, like when you initially do it, you get one or two years to start. Right. And then you have an annual fee. Really, at that point, they'd say, OK, what do you want to do with them? Mm -hmm. OK, so a lot of people might just say you know, destroy them. Mm -hmm. Others might say, you know, donate them to science, mm -hmm. which is a very common thing we see with embryos, with discarded embryos as well. And we actually have a whole network of research that we do with patients' right. embryos to, right. that is really important, amazing research coming right. out of that. Or some people might choose to donate them to other people. Yeah, I would imagine that would be a real productive way for people who need egg donors because that's a very expensive process mm -hmm. and a complicated process. But there must be so many people of eggs that they're willing to donate, or is it? Do they sort of feel squeamish about it because it's their genetic material being passed well, on? Well, it's it's something that's very personal yeah. for people. Um, right. I feel like people might have a harder time letting go of embryos and eggs. Right. But. You know, I had a patient who was so lovely and she made embryos with her husband, but she had a same sex male couple friend mm -hmm. who she was very close with, who she actually gave half of her eggs to. So she did a stimulation cycle. Oh, and so they and could use their half one, to their sperm to their sperm and right. said, these are for you. And of course, all the legal legal paperwork yeah. and everything is, is signed off on. And then she had embryo that she she had babies. We we saw those babies be being born. So people get creative with these things. Mm -hmm. You know, if she's like, I'm doing this stimulation. She had good ovarian reserve. She was young. She said, let's let's give some to my friends who need them. Right. So, you know. It's a very personal decision. Yeah. There's there's options. Right. And these are things you, you obviously bring up at the beginning of the exactly. process, but it, they can evolve over time. Exactly. Now, in terms, of, I'm just curious for the people who are troubled by like embryonic research, mm -hmm. do they have the same troubles with research on eggs alone? Have you I seen that? I would say no. Right. It's different. No, I, I think that for everyone who believes that life begins mm -hmm. at fertilization, which is right. a very dangerous stance and right. something in the fertility right. field that would really move us back decades right. and be really horrible right. for, for families who are using infertility right. treatments. But this is before that point. I don't think yeah. anybody 
you know, could argue that life begins with an egg. You know, right. you really need a need a sperm. The, the sperm is good for, for, <laughs> for provides something. just some little piece piece of the puzzle there. But so, yeah, I, I don't think that that would be the case. OK, one last thing, totally unrelated, even though the podcast won't be dropped today. I understand you want to wish someone a happy birthday today. Oh, yeah. So it's my son's two year old birthday. He's a very, very happy kid. His name is Sammy. He's really sweet and cuddly. He is getting to his terrible twos and he throws his food on the floor a lot and, you know, things like that. But he's cute enough that I forgive him. <laughs> that will, that will, that will keep. You're just sur- for a man hater, you're surrounded by men. You have a, you have a five year old who just had a big ice cream and pinata party. Yes. So yeah. my both my boys, I have two sons, um, are fall babies. So October uh, and November, about a month apart. Uh-huh. So it's been a fun month of birthdays. And we've been getting creative with coronavirus doing our outdoor parties. And my son is in a pod with his his class. Right. And so we There's had- a five-year-old, I assume. Five-year-old, yeah. yeah. We had them all over for the pinatas and ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> and we we bought last minute. I just did the piñatas and ice cream the day before. My husband tells me, "Oh, by the way, I bought a bouncy house too. I oh, thought nice. maybe there wouldn't be enough entertainment." Yeah. So now we own a bouncy house. Oh, you didn't rent it. You we bought did it. not rent it because my husband crunched the numbers and it was like you know less right. than a hundred dollars extra to just buy it right and he got an end of the season sale it's like super size me exactly <laughs> um so we've got this huge bag of them um, in our in our garage that's this massive bouncy house but you know it's really popular with the kids so my my son yeah and the emergency room physicians yeah <laughs> <laughs> the only thing they well, like better is the trampoline yeah, you know, I, I think I'm going to hold off on the trampoline. I've seen some things in medical school that have scarred me for life oh with my the trampoline. My, my, That's the one thing that we caved on everything with our kids because we're such pushovers. Uh, we even got dogs, right, ultimately. <laughs> but I put my foot, I said, we're not getting a trampoline. I just, I just can't. Yeah. I can't be in charge of that. I just, I, I've seen too much. I don't want to be, I don't want any part of that. So no yes. trampoline. Wow, excellent. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on. This is great. First of all, it's great to catch up. I love seeing you. It's just so nice to see how you've grown from your I young know. tadpole stage as a first year medical student where you, you know, knew nothing. You couldn't read or write, as you said. <laughs> and now you're, you know, you're a, a researcher, you're a doctor, you're an OBGYN, you're an infertility doctor, you're you're living out in Chappaqua with the Clintons. You know, you got a bouncy house, you got kids. It's 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 all going for you. You're doing awesome. And Thank you're really you. and, you're, and you're great on the podcast because, you know, as you know, you're you're fun. You're funny. So Thank it's good. Thank you. I try. It helps. <laughs> do you do that with patience? You keep your personality? Do you get all do you get all like Madam no, Serious? I try on them? I try and crack a couple jokes in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Whenever I can, throw at least one or two in. A zinger. Um, yeah. yes. And and try and Get a smile is really, it makes me happy to get a smile from a patient. It's all about. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Healthful Woman podcast. To learn more about our podcast, please visit our website at www.healthfulwoman.com. That's H E A L T H F U L W O M A N.com. If you have any questions about this podcast or any other topic you would like us to address, please feel free to email us at hw at healthfulwoman.com. Have a great day. The information discussed in Healthful Woman is intended for educational uses only. It does not replace medical care from your physician. Healthful Woman is meant to expand your knowledge of women's health and does not replace ongoing care from your regular physician or gynecologist. We encourage you to speak with your doctor about specific diagnoses and treatment options for an effective treatment plan.